Lawyers of Reddit, what's the most ridiculous argument you've heard in court? Story one, Lawyer who is not practicing in court, but when I was in college doing my bachelor's degree, criminal law was part of the curriculum, and this included spending a couple of days observing criminal trials. The things you witness, anyway, at the start of one of these trials, a guy with the greasiest mullet enters the room. Thin, tall, disproportionately sized limbs, tattoos all over. I swear the way he sat before the judge, the only thing that was missing was a beer in his hand and a chicken under his arm. Now this guy chose not to have a lawyer represent him, as he's a regular and spends short periods of time in jail or doing community service pretty much every month anyway. Real problem case, sweets, alcoholism, etc. But still he comes across as a really sympathetic dude and has a really entertaining way of telling a story while keeping a straight face and not realizing how funny he is. He knows he's getting fined, and a couple of hours of cutting is community service to keep our Dutch streets nice and tidy, but tries to win the sympathies of the judge to decrease his sentence. This man's dog was sent to a dog shelter when they found it malnourished a couple of weeks before when they brought him in for dealing real sad, but also the reason he's standing trial. The guy got high as a kite and drunk as an Irishman on St. Patrick's and while completely out of his mind, decided to get his dog back from the shelter because he really missed his girl. The judge asks him if it's correct that he broke the lock and some of the camera equipment on site of the dog shelter, and he confirms. You could really tell from his passionate account of the progression of the evening that he did all this out of pure love as his dog, according to him, was the only thing that pulled him through all of his rough patches with his girlfriend and his candy problem. So the judge orders camera footage to be shown to confirm that it is the suspect, and he confirms. On it, he is seen stumbling about and wrenching one of the dog enclosures open and hugging a German shepherd. At this point, everyone is touched by seeing this guy be so emotional on the camera footage with the dog, hugging it, petting it, and playing with it, and you can see the judge really get into it as well. Anyway, so this guy continues with his story and tells about how he took the dog to his car and went home never feeling happier in his life and ends his account with the driest delivery of, needless to say, I was flipping surprised when I woke up the next day and there was a German shepherd in my room instead of a Staffordshire Terrier. Everyone just broke out in laughter. He didn't get what was funny. Turns out the dude stole the wrong dog. Judge sentenced him to 50 hours of community service and 3,000 euros or so repairs for the broken doors and camera equipment. Story two, law student, former professor's story. Defendant busted for possession of narcotics. They were in the pocket of his leather jacket. He argues the search was illegal because with his buttery smooth leather jacket, there's no way the officer would have felt the sweets in his pocket during a pat down. So he shouldn't have reached in the pocket to find the sweets in the first place. Judge asks if the jacket is the one he was currently wearing in court. It was. Judge asks to feel this jacket in the pockets. Defendant hands it to the bailiff. Judge finds more sweets in the pocket. Needless to say, it didn't go well for him. Story three. Oh, geez, where do I start? I mean, I could tell plenty of these about my own clients, but I like this one. A lady has an injury comp case. It's for her upper back and, of course, complex regional pain syndrome. She decides she needs the insurance company to pay for a special mattress for her like a $6,000 memory foam with heat and massage and a thousand other features. And not just a twin, she needs a California king because, of course, her layabout unemployed boyfriend needs to sleep there too. We spend months litigating this oh-no thing. Finally, she buys it herself, and my client agrees to give her $1,500 just to be done with it. The judge takes me and the defense attorney aside and says he's going to beat us to the punch if we say the word mattress in his court again after wasting all this time. It was that ridiculous. Not three months go by and the case comes on for another hearing. After exhausting all the chiropractic care allowed under the law, her doctor was seeking a variance to get some additional chiropractic. We get to court and I'm arguing it should be denied, etc. Judge turns to her and says, Ma'am, why do you feel you need more chiropractic care? She pauses for a minute then says, I'm having a lot of trouble sleeping on my mattress. I think I saw a breathe coming out of his ears. Story four. I was in the public gallery for this while studying law. I was not the lawyer. Leeds Crown Court back in the early 90s. 75, you foreign. Yes, this is important. Man was facing a preliminary hearing at relating to charges that he had sexually touched a 13 year relative. His barrister made a successful plea for bail based upon this man being an established pillar of the immigrant community. And the judge asked the old man if he had anything to say before he was bailed until the next hearing in a month. He made two comments. One, she was wearing very, very tight shorts and I should not be held responsible because no real man could resist see something like that. The judge reminded his, this was a preliminary hearing, not a trial, so he should wait until the trial to argue his case, especially statements that are far from exculpatory and are better suited to mitigation. Two, I cannot reappear in a month because I'm flying back to my home country tomorrow and will not be coming back. The barrister appeared to be just as surprised as the rest of us. 
The judge ordered the defendant's passport seized, and he was remanded in custody until his trial. Story five. I heard this story from a cop. A man was arrested for charges of assault and assault. This was in Oklahoma, and I'm in Texas, so I'm not sure what the offense is called there. Anyway, he was being accused of shoving the women on the ground where there was some debris and she sustained injuries, hence the assault, and then accused of violently assaulting her. During court, the injuries were mentioned. The man representing himself objects. Allegedly, his exact words were, so how do you know that the injuries were from when I pushed her down and not from when I assaulted her? From what I heard, the judge's face was priceless. Story six. Girlfriend is a Reddit lurker, posting on her behalf. This is a story that my grandpa always tells. So some of the details are fuzzy, but this is the gist of it. My grandpa was a public defender, and this was a defense he used for one of his clients, who was being accused of attempting to break into a car. How it happened. Manhash 1 is sitting in his house, and he looks out the window and sees Manhash 2 next to a car parked in the street. Uh, Manhash 2 is out there fiddling with the car door for like 10 minutes, and so Manhash 1 realizes he's trying to break into the car and calls the cops. Manhash 2 runs, and eventually Manhash 3, my grandpa's client, is picked up nearby because he matched the description of Manhash 2. So my grandpa is meeting with his client and telling him what he's accused of. Client asks, wait, what kind of car was it? Grandpa tells him. Client says, I can prove that it wasn't me. Grandpa, how? Client, you said the guy was out there for 10 minutes. I can break into that car in less than 20 seconds. Grandpa, prove it. So he finds one of whatever kind of car it was, and the client proceeds to pick the lock in 12 seconds. Grandpa gets the judge out there, and the client does it again for the judge, who makes him do it one more time and then dismisses the case. Story 7. Several years ago, I was doing a civil trial, personal injury, defending a woman who allegedly hit a bus matron with her car. We had offered to concede liability and just try damages. In other words, the jury wouldn't hear the circumstances of how the injury happened, just that we agreed my client caused the injury, and they would only decide the amount of damages. We had evidence that the plaintiff was significantly exaggerating her injuries. The plaintiff's attorney refused to agree to our concession, thinking that if the jury heard the circumstances, they'd want to give even more money to punish my client. So we went to trial on liability. The plaintiff called one witness, her client, who testified that an older woman in a green car hit her. They rested and I moved for a dismissal for failure to prove a case. There was literally no evidence connecting my client to this incident, just an older woman in a green car. The plaintiff never bothered to call my client to the stand. The attorney told the judge that the bus driver had written down my client's license plate and gave it to the police. They never bothered trying to find the bus driver. The attorney asked if she could just put the police report in and I objected that it was hearsay. The attorney then actually said, please just let me put this in. I haven't had work in a while and I got retained by a firm to try this case. I really need to win this. Of course I didn't agree, and the judge dismissed the case. I felt a little bad for her, but that was maybe the worst presentation of a case I ever saw. I spoke with the jury afterwards and they all said they hated the plaintiff, didn't believe a word she said, and likely would have found in my favor anyway. Moral of the story, be prepared in court. Story 8. Recovering small business BK attorney here. Was in bankruptcy court on a motion of my own when a very young attorney gets up to argue his position. His request was denied in pre-hearing disposition. Young attorney, YA. Your Honor, I believe your reading of the three cases you have cited is incorrect. Bankruptcy court judge, BKJ. You think that, do you? Yeah, yes, Your Honor. I don't think the bankruptcy appellate panel believed these cases would be used in this fashion. And I think you are misreading the author's scope. BKJ, okay. Tell me, as those are baby opinions, who wrote those opinions? Yeah, I'm not sure, Your Honor. I didn't check. BKJ. In the future, you may want to check those sorts of things. All three cases were authored by the judge you just told didn't understand his own writing. Court audience, mostly attorneys. Asterisk collective gasp, asterisk yay, yay. Asterisk blank stare, asterisk BKJ. Asterisk face palm, asterisk Jesus, son. I wrote those opinions, yeah. Oh, well, I still think they're wrong. BKJ, request denied. Get the hell out of my courtroom. It was, quite possibly, the most awkward type of walk of shame I've ever seen as he gathered his things and left. Story 9? Edit. Actual lawyer here. Hands down the most ridiculous argument I've ever heard was a constitutionalist, asterisk, pro se asterisk, defendant, trying to explain why the court lacked jurisdiction over him. I was prepared for the standard arguments about Freeman on the land, non-corporate natural person, admiralty court, etc. But this one was different. This particular defendant was part of a Jehovah's Witness compound and happened to be Marshallese American. That is, he was black. After the court patiently explained to him that it has jurisdiction over all persons in the county, the defendant promptly piped up that, under the asterisk Dred Scott asterisk decision, he wasn't a person and the court had no jurisdiction. Story 10. Prosecutor here. 
had a case where a man assaulted his six-year-old daughter because she wore suggestive clothing and seemed to be asking for it. He tried to argue that, you know, girls are just sexually active at a younger age now. I remember thinking, what would Dexter do? Anyway, man got convicted and is now serving two life sentences plus 100 years. Edit. The reason for that sentence is that he will not be eligible for parole. He was convicted of two counts of assault, two counts of incest, and two counts of aggravated child molestation. In my jurisdiction, you're eligible for parole on a, a life sentence after 30 years. Life and life without parole are two different sentences. Here, he was not eligible for life without parole. So in theory, at least, yes, he could serve two consecutive life sentences, which would be 60 years, and then parole. Now, however, we are certain he never draws another breath as a free man. I've done several of these cases, and to me, they're much harder than murder cases because of the pressure. In this case, the man had no other complaints than this as a father. So if I lost, the poor girl goes back to dad. Story 11. Not so much ridiculous as ghastly, but a man accused of assaulting his own daughter, saying he couldn't have done so because he had a nine-inch cock and it would have caused her damage. And that the physical signs of close relationship activity that she did exhibit were because she'd been screwing the family dog. I don't do criminal law anymore. That was enough for me. Edit. Lots of people asking what happened should probably have put that in here originally. I'd left the firm by the time it actually got to trial, but was kept in the loop about the case by friends still there. He was found guilty and went off to prison. Story 12. This came in a deposition, but it's still one of my funniest stories from this old job. I worked part-time as a paralegal when I was in college. We had this massive case with a lot of people involved that had spun out into a bunch of little side cases. In one of those side cases, this guy was claiming our client had left him threatening voicemails related to the main case, and him and his wife sued for loss of consortium. Loss of consortium, and I swear to you this is a real thing, basically means something happened that is stopping a married couple from having close relationship, and they want to sue you over it. The guy was claiming that he was so scared from these voicemails that he couldn't sleep with his wife anymore. Deposition time rolls around, and I'm sitting in the other room, but it's a small office, and I can hear everything. My boss starts asking the wife how we're supposed to know that it was our client's fault they stopped having close relationship. Maybe she's just not as attracted to him anymore. Maybe he's not attracted to her. Maybe they didn't have that much of a close relationship life to begin with, etc. So this woman starts yelling, I love close relationship, and banging her fists on the table. Her lawyers try to calm her down and tell her to stop talking, but she keeps on shouting, I love close relationship! We use close relationship two, three times a day. We'd be thrown out of hotels because of the noise we'd make. And to the protestation of everyone in the room, her counsel and ours, she proceeded to describe their close relationship history in graphic detail, all of which was recorded in the deposition and filed with the court. Story 13, actual lawyer. What I dub the surprise party defense. In a hearing for an order of protection in which ex-wife is trying to get an order of protection against ex-husband who had been stalking her. They have a high school age child together. Ex-husband tries to argue against the order of protection by saying they may need to be able to communicate about the child. The judge points out that they can communicate through the child, and also that other family members have been put in place by the juvenile court to be intermediaries re-pickup, drop-off, etc. Then ex-husband has a brilliant light bulb idea. Judge, what if I need to throw my son a surprise party and I need to keep it secret from everyone? But his mom still needs to know so she doesn't throw a party the same day. In other words, while I admit have been stalking my ex-wife and that there are grounds to grant an order of protection, you should not grant that order just in case I need to throw a surprise party one day. What made it was how clever he thought the argument was. Thus was born the surprise party defense. Edit. A lot of you are upset about the comment of communicating through the child. That was probably a poor way to phrase it. In this situation, the father would be barred from passing messages to the mother through the child. He can't say, tell your mom X. But of course, some indirect communication is going to occur, and that is what the judge was referring to. In other words, the father cannot argue that he needs to be able to have direct communication with the mother for purposes of coordinating childcare, things like that, which is often the issue. Because the child in this case is old enough to tell both parents, for example, about school, friends, trips, grades, etc. It is not as if the judge ordered the child to be the intermediary. That is ridiculous. Also, I sort of simplified the complexities of it because these people's parental arrangement was not the point. The dumbness of the argument was the point. But this is a criminal judge determining an order of protection. There is a whole separate juvenile family court judge that actually determines the custody arrangement and things of that nature. The bottom line is, the guy was trying to use the kid as an excuse to avoid an order of protection so he could continue to stalk and harass his ex-wife. Story 14. Several years ago, I was junior counsel in a prosecution in which the state alleged the 30-year-old male accused sexually penetrated his 13-year-old foster daughter. 
Part of the state case relied on SMS messages allegedly sent by this asterisk gentleman asterisk to the complainant. Some of them were pretty bad. I won't repeat them. But there were some which amounted to, sorry, I thought you liked it when I did X. Defense counsel conceded that if he asterisk did asterisk send those messages, that it would have been very inappropriate. Later, during closing argument, defense counsel argued, surely it would have been more appropriate if he wrote, you have lovely breasts, or I want you to have my children. Uh, to your 13-year-old foster child? While in the same house you share with your wife? You're right, that's way better. Story 15. I'm a prosecutor now, but I used to have a private practice where I did a lot of evictions. My usual landlord clients wouldn't even come into my office until their tenants had been behind for months. And most of the time, the tenants were defiant in their non-payment. So it wasn't difficult to not take pity on them. Anyway, one tenant was a particularly dumb guy. He usually came to court dressed in a wife beater and cut off jeans. We had a trial date set and my client and I showed up. Tenant did not. At the last second before the judge entered a default, some woman comes bursting into the courtroom and yells, Daryl's on the phone. The judge allows her to bring the phone up and we put tenant on speaker. He proceeds to ask the judge to delay the trial for one week because my brother got his head knocked inside out and is probably going to pass away. I didn't buy it, but my client knew Daryl well enough to sense the stress and fear in his voice. I told the judge that we would allow the continuance, but only until the next available court day. The judge set it for one week out. I still didn't believe Daryl until that night my grandfather was in an accident and we had to rush to the hospital. As we're walking up the hallway, I see Daryl in a room with a bunch of people who dressed like him enough to obviously be family. When we get to my grandpa's room, he ended up being not as seriously injured as we originally feared. The first thing he says is, you'll never guess what happened to the guy down the hall. Nurse told me his idiot brother dropped a tractor bucket on his head and opened it like a cracked egg. He's in a coma now. I relayed the news to my client, and she felt sorry enough for Daryl that we signed an agreement stating that he would clear out within 15 days and we would forgive all back rent owed. Story 16. This never made it to court. I asked my divorce lawyer what was the worst thing a client had asked him to argue. I was expecting a I want the salad spinner sort of story. He had a client, a professor in his 70s, who was divorcing from his wife, also a professor in her 70s. They were both Jewish. His wife had a tattoo on her arm. It was a number put there by the Nazis when they put her in a concentration camp in WW2 as a child. Husband was born in the U.S., was not German. The German government was in the process of settling a case with the survivors. She had some amount of money, a six-figure sum due to her. The husband wanted his lawyer to argue that he should get half the settlement money. The lawyer told him that there was a special circle in hell for lawyers who ask for stuff like that and that he was not planning on ending up there. Story 17. Wasn't the other lawyer, but his client took the stand in a retail theft trial, claimed he didn't steal a couple salmon fillets on purpose. He was just so flustered by a phone conversation with his girlfriend that he accidentally slipped them into the pockets of his jacket. In a part of the store, the loss prevention officer called Shoplifter Alley because it's a blind spot for the cameras and walked out without realizing it. It's not like it was a candy bar or something small. It was two salmon fillets. I asked him, have you ever done that before? Him. No. Me. Have you ever seen anyone, anywhere, ever put fish like that in their pocket in your entire life? Him, no. Mercifully, the jury did not buy his ludicrous story and found him guilty. Story 18. I am a lawyer. Had a female inmate claim she was molested by one of the guards. One of her most damning pieces of testimony was testifying to this large vertical scar he had on his chest from a heart operation. She continued to say that she remembered this huge scar from when he molested her. The guard got on the stand, took his shirt off, and he had a tiny yee horizontal scar up on his shoulder. Case over. He had apparently told her one time that he had surgery, and she assumed it would have left his giant scar and used that to make up her story. Edit. To clarify, I was a new clerk for the judge when the trial started. I don't know exactly why this didn't come out in discovery. My guess? Plaintiff's counsel were two years out of law school, appointed to the case, had only done corporate law, and were from a monster NYC firm, so probably didn't give it any time. As for the defense, either the Department of Corrections wanted to publicly humiliate the inmate, people make a lot of dumb decisions based on a screw you mentality, or defense counsel wanted to get that trial money. Story 19. Also a lawyer uh, had opposing counsel try to argue that because a landlady had written on her eviction notice, it has been a pleasure getting to know you, but please leave, but had testified they were awful tenants that she hated, that she was dishonest and nothing she said could be trusted, opened the question of dishonesty wide open. Although landlady wasn't an angel, tenants had an enormous string of fraud priors we could tell the court about as a result. Edit because of confusion around impeachability doors. This is UK law and relates to gateways for admissibility of bad character evidence. Story 20. Not a lawyer, but I do have a story for this. This happened while I was working as a medical assistant. 
One of our diabetic patients got a speeding ticket while his blood glucose was low, and he seemed to be under the impression that this would be an ironclad excuse to get him out of it. So he calls our office one day and I answer, PT will be the patient, me. Doctor, X's office, not his name if that wasn't obvious, the dark waffle speaking. How may I help you? P, hello, TDW. I need the doctor to write a letter for me. Me, I can definitely help with that. We do this frequently, usually for a jury duty excuse or a note stating they need to bring their medications with them when they travel, etc. What is the letter for? I got a speeding ticket last weekend and I'm going to contest it. I need a letter from the doctor stating that I have diabetes and that it impairs my ability to drive, so it wasn't my fault I was speeding. Me, me, let me run through this with you, just so I'm clear what you're asking for. PT, okay, me, you want a letter stating you have diabetes? PT, yes, me, and you want it to say your diabetes impairs your ability to drive? Pete, yes, me, and you believe telling the judge that your diabetes impairs your ability to drive will get him to throw out the ticket? Pete, yes, me, I don't think that's a good idea, sir, PT, what, why? Me, even if they agree with your argument and toss out the ticket, which I doubt they will, if you tell them that you have a medical condition that impairs your driving ability, I'm pretty sure they'll take your license away. Pet. No, no. See, I'm only impaired when my blood sugar is low. Me. Right, but this would go on for a few minutes before I told him I'd ask the doctor and see what he thinks. Unsurprisingly, the doctor agreed with me, said he would lose his license if he did that. So we didn't write the letter, but he still brought this argument to traffic court. The patient is now driven to his appointments by his family members. Story 21. Made a left turn on a green turn arrow. A city bus ran a red and T-boned me. My car was a little VW rabbit, so it just scooted me and I was perfectly fine. Driver pulls over, comes out and says, The sun was in my eyes. I say, I'm not hurt. Thanks for asking. Police arrive and guess what? There was a literal busload full of witnesses. Everyone had the same story. She ran a red. City paid for my car, etc. She denied wrongdoing and went to court, which I had to attend along with a witness or two and the officer. Her defense? She had a migraine. Judge. So I should let you off the hook because you had a bad headache and was driving into the sun? Driver, yes, your honor. I'm glad you understand. She got her commercial vehicle license revoked. Should have just taken the points. Story 22. I wasn't a lawyer, but a law clerk working with the prosecutor's office. This guy was caught on the highest quality security cam video I've ever seen, stabbing a store clerk like 15 times. She survived. And then was tackled a block away from the scene not five minutes later by a man who had seen him flee and followed him. 25 feet from the knife and the jacket he'd been wearing that was covered in blood with a receipt with his name on it in the pocket. It was the literal definition of a slam dunk case. The guy chose to proceed to trial without his lawyer instead of having the case postponed after his attorney's house was broken into and all his files were stolen. This guy's main argument was that it wasn't him. Because in the statement of probable cause written by the officers after the incident, they misspelled his highly unique last name by adding a T in the middle. For example, Johnson became Johnston. He spelled his name out at every opportunity with much emphasis. He also argued it couldn't be him because the man on the video tied a T-shirt around his head so that the distinctive tattoos there would be hidden. But he would never cover over his tattoos like that because he was proud of them and they represented his heritage as a Korean man. The jury took less than a half hour to return a guilty verdict. Story 23. Waiting for my case to be called, I heard a wild argument. It was a domestic violence case, and the petitioner, person seeking protection, was accusing respondent, ex-boyfriend, of abuse. Specifically, he head-butted her. The respondent argued back by saying, Seriously, honestly, judge, I couldn't have because look at my head, it's huge. A head this big would leave a mark. Honestly, judge, look at my head. To which the judge responded, Son, I have a big head. Look at my head. This went on for a minute. Now, the story doesn't stop here. It just gets better. The respondent then argues that petitioner is keeping him from seeing their daughter and that she went as far as putting her uncle as the baby's father on the birth certificate. At this point, I look around with shock. The clerk's mind is slowly grasping what he said, and the judge nods his head with a typical Tuesday smirk. Story 24. I'm a lawyer. The most ridiculous argument I've seen was one I actually made. One of my clients got busted cooking meth. This was an asterisk, very asterisk, clear-cut case. They actually caught him in the middle of a cook. No way he was getting out of this one. Even worse, he was cooking at home and children were there. Yep. The DA loaded him up with felonies, there was no bail, and he was being held in the county jail. My client knew he was messed up. He had been planning to get married a few weeks after he got busted. My client asks me if he can get released for 24 hours so he can still get married. I tell him that I'll ask, but that there's no way in flipping hell they'll let him out. First, I ask the DA if they will allow it. Nope, they laugh. So I file a motion with the court. Now, I knew the judge was a crusty old conservative family values kind of guy, who also has a raging erection for candy crime. There was no law involved but I put together an argument about the sanctity of marriage, 
and how the state should encourage marriage at all times and that sort of thing. We have a hearing and I make the argument, the DA is totally opposed and calls it ridiculous. And the judge grants it. The judge actually decided to allow my client out for 24 hours to get married. He had to surrender at the county jail at 8 a.m. the next day in some other conditions. But still, he was allowed out. Everyone is stunned. Nobody can believe it. The day of the wedding comes, my client gets out, gets married, then goes back to the jail. Everything went exactly like how it was supposed to, which is also pretty shocking. Story 25. Public defender checking in. Apart from the usual sociopaths who argue that there's nothing wrong with cheating people, stealing, and screwing people over. And apart from the constitutionalists who want me to argue that because they put their hands over their eyes, the government can't see them anymore. There are some good stories. I had a client accused of hit-and-run damage to unattended property. To wit, a stop sign post. My client had parked his car in front of a gas pump and walked into a quickie mart. The car rolled away from the pump without him, rolled over the curb and then over a stop sign and into a ditch. My client ran out of the store, got in car, and promptly sped off. His driver's license was also suspended at the moment. This was all captured on video by a conveniently timed passing city bus. My guy wants me to argue that it wasn't hit and run because he wasn't driving the car when the thing got hit. He's got exactly half a point. I had to tell him that his argument solved, at most, half of the problem because it sure as hell was him driving for the run part of the hit and run. He took the plea deal. Story 26. My parents are both lawyers. Was in court with my dad when I was younger. Dad is throwing out objection after objection at the opposing counsel during cross-examination. Judge is sustaining all of them. Several hours into this, the judge is getting restless and asks the opposing counsel to hurry it up. Opposing counsel responds, Well, if Mr. Surname would stop objecting, perhaps I could get through my examination. Judge did not like this. She lays into the guy. If you would stop asking objectable questions, Mr. Surname wouldn't have to object. Hurry this, I am not going to sit here all day. Was pretty cool to watch as a kid. Dude got roasted. Dad won that trial. Story 27. I'm a lawyer. The highlight's real. I wasn't drunk. I was stumbling because I was shot in the Cuba Revolution 10 years ago. This didn't match up because we weren't 10-year post-Cuban Revolution. Also, being shot doesn't make you smell of cheap beer. I didn't know candy was a controlled substance, so having candy wasn't a crime. I'm an addict, so it's okay I had candy. I need it as a medication. My designated driver got drunk, so I had to drive drunk. Being prescribed medication and going to a therapist for a diagnosed close relationship addiction doesn't make you a close relationship addict. Because I'm Irish, there's a presumption I'm drunk to an Irish American day, police officer and judge. Marijuana will be legal soon, so you can't charge me now. I didn't personally sign the Constitution, so it doesn't apply to me. And my favorite, if I'm arrested, it'll be violated on probation, so you can't charge me with a crime. Not you can't, as in please don't, but actually, it would be illegal to do so. Story 28. A taxi driver was charged with assault for pelting stone at a bus driver after a minor accident between both vehicles. Defense lawyer, your lordship the bus driver was injured on right side of his neck. It is not possible for my client to cause that injury. The bus is right-hand drive and the door on left side of the bus was open and driver was in driver's seat. State, your lordship, is counsel unaware that buses have windows? Defense, the window was closed. Judge, really? How many times in this tilde, very hot and humid Indian city, Tilda, have you seen a bus drive around with windows closed unless it was raining? Defense, I request adjournment, your lordship. Story 29. Not a lawyer, but I thought this was a very strange defense. Gary Heidnick had a history of mental illness, but nonetheless made a fortune in the stock market and had enough to retire indefinitely. In the late 80s, he decided to kidnap five women and chain them to the wall in the basement where he assaulted them every day, as well as tortured them. He was fond of electrocuting them for not getting pregnant. When one of the women starved to death, he forced the other women to eat her body mixed with dog food. Another woman, when getting her routine electrocution torture, was accidentally electrocuted to death. One of the remaining three victims asked if she could visit family if she promised to come back. He agreed and she called the police. In court, he claimed that he had committed no crime because the women were already chained in the basement when he moved in. Story 30. When I was clerking for a judge in my first year as a lawyer, we had a case that centered around if a person could lawfully shoot a dog that is attacking his chickens. The law said that he could shoot him if the dogs were bothering or wounding the chickens. Plaintiff was suing for the value of his dogs that were terminated in emotional distress. His argument was that the dogs were not bothering or wounding the chickens because they were running away when the farmer came outside with the shotgun. He then argues that wounding has to be active. So he gave an example. If the dog has a chicken in his mouth, you can shoot. If he drops it, but the chicken is floundering right in front of him, you cannot shoot as the wounding has ended. Picks it back up, shoot the mutt, lightly pause at it. Not wounding. It was ridiculous and inconsistent with case law. I wrote the opinion awarding defendant summary judgment. Here comes my favorite part. 
Plaintiff asks for a reconsideration based on a single word I used in a throwaway line in the eight-page opinion. I said it was reasonable to assume that the dogs were still a danger to the chickens. During the reconsideration, the partner from the firm comes for plaintiff instead of Joe Schmo and says, Frankly, Judge, I have always thought you were the finest attorney in the region, so I'm shocked you got this so wrong. It's baffling to me. Judge didn't react, but I was plenty offended on his behalf. So I am tasked with writing the reconsideration opinion. I wrote a two-page summary of the hearing, with no indication on the two pages which way we were leaning, then pasted the original eight pages, but with the sentence about reasonableness omitted. I wish I could have watched that lawyer read three pages deep to realize it was the exact same decision as before. Story 31. Car accident case where the plaintiff was clearly trying to ham it up, brought friends and family for backup, and the stories were all inconsistent. Cried on the stand. It was a small accident, and the plaintiff wanted a lot of money for sprains. The attorney said, yeah, there are inconsistencies and crazy stories. But you don't believe the person who tells you the same thing every time. That is the person pulling the wool over your eyes. Um, no. Honest people are consistent. The attorney also had his client testify that no interpreters were used when they were, and that there was confusion about a question regarding a prior accident when that question was never asked. Edit. I'm a lawyer. Story 32. In child support. Your Honor, I already have three children that I pay for. I can't pay for a fourth. Asterisk. Are you the father of this fourth child? Yes, and I cannot afford her. I have three others. Ordered to pay full support for the fourth child to the surprise of no one. In spousal support, I'm an iron worker by trade. But I work in Kohl's, asterisk. Why don't you work as an iron worker? Certainly it pays more. They expect me to work weekends. That ain't happening. Ordered to pay full spousal support on an imputed income of an iron worker. In criminal court for harassment. I sent pictures of my testicles to her, XGF to see if she thought one looked too big. It was medical, not harassment, asterisk. What about the picture of your banana? Same. I thought it looked weird, like I was sick. I needed advice. Asterisk, is your ex-GF a medical professional? No. Asterisk, what is her profession? She's a kindergarten teacher. Asterisk, turning your attention back to the pictures you texted, you said they were medical inquiries made to your kindergarten teacher, ex-GF, correct? Yes, asterisk. What about this photo with the caption, suck my banana? Was that also medical in nature? Story 33. Defendant wanted to take back his guilty plea, arguing that the only reason he pled guilty was because he had to take a huge cow at the time, but didn't want to do so at the courthouse. Another defendant argued that his was denied the effective assistance of counsel because his defense counsel permitted him to plead guilty to a DUI 20 years ago, after the guy crashed his car into a wall and was drunk off his peach at 5 a.m. in January. His defense was that he crashed his car, then in the 30 mins, one hour waiting for the police, walked in the freezing cold to a liquor store, and drank a whole bottle of whiskey. And so he wasn't technically driving while intoxicated, but became intoxicated afterwards. The judge described the guy as either highly courageous or highly foolhardy for offering that story. Different defendant claimed his guilty plea was not knowing, intelligent, and voluntary, and therefore invalid, because he was high as cow off candy and alcohol when he came into the courthouse at 9 a.m., I've responded to countless motions from defendants who've said that they didn't know they'd be deported if they pled guilty, even though the judge explicitly told them exactly that. One defendant claimed that he couldn't have committed the robbery by climbing through the bathroom window because he has arthritis and knee and hip problems. He testified to this, despite knowing that we had security footage of him climbing in through a window of a church, also to rob it, then jumping up and climbing out and despite knowing that the judge was going to allow us to show it to the jury if defendant opened the door to such evidence. Non-citizen defendant, who's a level three highest close relationship offender, argued that his designation should be lowered, removed because he was deported, and therefore he doesn't present a danger to the community anymore. Story 34. Slightly different, but worth noting. I recall off that there was a guy arrested for multiple assaults and the murder of a young woman. He was sentenced, and in prison, he injured himself to go to hospital. He then broke out, assaulted another woman, and took a family hostage before being arrested again. He tried for parole, and his claim followed the lines of this. Whilst the victim of the crime only has to suffer for a minute or an hour, the person who commits the crime has to suffer many, many years exiled from society. He got rejected 18 times and passed away before the 19th. Edit. Corrected spelling from parole to parole. Many thanks. Edit 2. Corrected spelling from exiled to exiled. Thanks again. Edit 3. Apparently, the video I linked was incorrect in some of its content. Read link for more. Story 35. Lawyer here as well. Literally anything that the constitutionalists, pro we, are you detaining me, sovereign citizens makes. This stuff goes back a long time. 20 years ago, I was getting the, they are impeding my freedom to travel, 
and now it's the I'm a corporation arguments. I really wish people would stop believing that the law consists of magic words and incantations that lawyers have hidden from you. It isn't. They don't exist. You're driving us all nuts, and you make the judges angry at you. Ridiculous argument I made. Client was arrested for failing to appear. She fell asleep under the trailer of a truck at a carnival she traveled with, and they drove off and left her there on the ground. Argument. Your Honor, she didn't miss court to disrespect the court. She's just stupid. Right? You're not exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. Client sheepishly nods. Judge drops the charge. Story 36. A lawyer here. I sued the local sheriff in charge of running county jails here for not providing a voter registration application to inmates who request it. Instead, the sheriff had them fill out another form requesting both the application and a pen. His attorney initially argued that it's because the inmates don't have access to a pen. When I pointed out that a voter registration application can be filled out with a pencil, he changed his argument, saying that they don't have access to a pencil either. So I asked him, how do inmates fill out the request form for a pencil then? With their blood? He dropped that argument and settled. Story 37. In an aggravated assault case, there was a clear video from the Walmart parking lot of the defendant getting in the passenger side of a car, riding a little ways, and then hopping out to rob a guy, ultimately shot victim in the stomach. Police stopped the car soon after 911 was called and the guys were arrested. The defense refused all offers for plea deals and went to trial based solely on the defense that the driver and passenger switched seats, with the car still moving, in the 10 seconds between him hopping in and hopping out. It was his third violent offense, and the defendant got life in prison. Story 38. So an important part of any legal case is that both sides be able to depose the other side's witnesses. This usually includes the plaintiff. My client was a very elderly woman who was hit by another car in a parking lot. She was not in good shape and had trouble getting around. Twice during the case, the other side scheduled a deposition. Twice during the case, my client showed up at our offices on time for the deposition. And both times, the other side did not appear. They never informed us or our elderly disabled client so she made the 30-minute trip to our office for nothing. At no point were any depositions canceled from us or our client. Those were the only two attempts made by the defendant. After the second time they canceled the deposition, they filed a motion in court to get our case dismissed on the grounds that they didn't have a sworn statement from our client yet. Again, this was asterisk, entirely the defendant's fault asterisk, but they filed a motion to dismiss the case against our client. When asked at the motion why they canceled the second deposition, they even said that the attorney responsible had a personal conflict. Thankfully, the judge didn't even give it a second thought and denied their motion. Story 39. Ah, I'm a lawyer. I should win right there. Anyway, we were in trial, and opposing counsel was objecting to a document I was trying to enter into evidence through one of their witnesses. The witness had identified it as one of their business records, but opposing counsel objects. The jury is in the courtroom, so the judge has us approach. We do, and opposing counsel argues the authenticity of the document. I was a little surprised. So my response was, Your Honor, this is their exhibit. Is counsel stating they submitted inauthentic documents to this court? Judge turns to counsel. Are you submitting non-authentic documents? Opposing counsel stammers out a no, and the document goes in. I was a little surprised they wanted to argue their own document wasn't authentic just to keep me from getting it to the jury. Story 40. Longtime lurker? And maybe I'm only posting BC. This happened like a week ago, but whatever. First time for everything. The criminal defense attorney representing a guy who stabbed his wife several times and then beat her with a frying pan and then stabbed her again tried to argue that it is an affirmative defense to attempted murder if you take your victim to the hospital after. He claimed it's impossible to attempt to murder somebody if you save her life after. He got bench slapped pretty hard, one, for the horrible legal argument, and two, for continuously saying this guy saved her life after he tried to terminate her. Story 41. I am a lawyer. This was a petition rather than an in-court appearance when I was an asterisk pro se asterisk clerk. Asterisk pro se asterisk clerks handle petitions from prisoners. This was a state case, and the petitioner claimed that because our state awards good time credits, for every 30 days you serve without problems, you get 10 days off of your sentence. For all sentences, even sentences of life, he had accumulated X years of credit against his sentence. Further, according to the actuarial tables, he would be dead in X years. Therefore, he was eligible for release. So far, this is a clever argument, even if it is bound to failure. What made it ridiculous was that he was not serving one life sentence, but two consecutive life sentences plus 20 years. Therefore, under his own analysis, he needed to serve more than his own lifespan before becoming eligible for release. As an added bonus, I dismissed his petition as lacking standing until he actually passed away, and we could properly calculate his sentence. Story 42. I was a state witness in a parental neglect trial. As an LCIW, I worked for a mental health substance abuse hospital evaluating children and teens for admission. The state was, was asking to have the kid removed from the home 
in part due to information I reported, as I had interviewed, admitted the kid on three separate occasions. During one eval, the mother shows up so high she can barely talk. The kid admits he gets all his sweets from her. The other evidence comes from info gathered during the kid's inpatient stays. So this is a very rural area with only two hospitals in the entire state. As such, I didn't work in the hospital, nor was I part of the inpatient staff. I lived three hours west of it, covering the 22 counties on the west side of the state. The prosecution had sworn statements and records from the inpatient staff and called me because I lived in the jurisdiction of this court and could testify in person. So all of this information was introduced the minute I took the stand. The defense lawyer basically repeats all of this and then proceeds to try get me to support his defense that the inpatient treatment was inadequate. How this relates the mother giving the kids sweets no one ever figured out. He has absolutely no witnesses of his own, no character references, no other hospital staff, nothing but the state's evidence and me. He repeatedly asks if I agree with his statements that X occurred in treatment or that if Y would have been a better option. After like the sixth time of me stating I was not able to answer the question, the judge cuts him off and asks if he has any other line of questioning. The mother whispers in his ear and he says, yes, he has one more question. Do I think the mother is a fit parent? I was stunned. I looked around at everyone and asked him, are you asking me in my professional capacity if I think the mother is fit to parent? I see the state just kind of smiling and shaking his head. The defense is certain and says that's what he's asking. I look at the judge, who smiles and nods at me to answer, so I say, no. In my professional opinion, she is not currently fit to parent. Everyone else is trying not to laugh, but the defense looks so disappointed, I almost felt sad for him. I don't know what WTF they were thinking, but needless to say, the state won. Story 43. Probably late, this will get buried, etc., etc. Also not a lawyer, but my dad was, and this came directly from him. It's the late 70 AS, early in my old man's career. Client gets done for speeding. Ticket says 90 and a 55. Cop states that he assessed the speed by tailing client for over a mile before pulling him over. My dad. What kind of car do you drive? Cop. Crown Vic. We all have Crown Vics, dad. And how high does the speedometer go in your Crown Vic? Cop. 85. Dad. So, how can you be sure my client was doing 90? Dismissed ticket and the cop and my dad had a good laugh about it afterward. Cop said he'd never heard of a going too fast defense before. Story 44. Not mine, but my old mock trial instructor. And how do we know that witness's testimony is reliable? Two, witness. You wear need to wear glasses, correct? Yes. So doesn't that mean that you are legally considered to have impaired vision? Yes. Prosecution proceeds to build most of their cross-examination on this leg, painting the witness as unreliable because of poor vision. Finally, defense gets a chance to question again. You wear glasses, Mr. Witness. Is that correct? Yes. So whenever you're wearing glasses, you have 20 20th vision, correct? Yes. Thank you. No further questions. Story 45. Damn it, this thread is five hours old and this comment will never see the light of day. But fudge it. This wasn't so much a bad argument, but an example of terrible questioning. This was a circular case, cleanup of polluted groundwater and soil. A witness, a former manager of the polluted property, was asked the following at a deposition. Q, did you ever see anything strange? At that point, a number of objections to the question were made by the attorneys present. A, what? Did I ever see anything strange is your question? Q, yes, sir. Did you ever see anything strange? A. Yes, I saw a man with ball. Q. You saw a man with ball at the site? A. No. I saw a man with ball in New Orleans once. 